Katmai's landscape is home to a diverse number of flora and fauna fighting to survive the harsh Alaskan environment. From the Brooks Falls platform, visitors and bear camp viewers can witness the resilience of Brooks bears as they fight to catch sockeye salmon that have fought against all odds to return to the Brooks River to spawn. Likewise, Katmai is also home to a number of other predators and prey, including one more elusive animal that you will not find catching fish on the lip of the falls, and that is the lynx. Welcome everyone to today's bear chat. I am Ranger Sarah, I'm here with Ranger Kara, and we will be talking about the predator-prey relationship between lynx and snowshoe hare. As always, if you have any questions, you can put them in the comments and we will get to some of those at the very end of today's broadcast. Kara, would you like to get us started by telling us a little bit more about this predator in Katmai? Sure. Uh, now, when you think of Katmai, most people think of the bears here. Uh, and occasionally a wolf will make an appearance on the bear cams. However, there's another large predator that's around that usually doesn't appear on the cameras, whether that's for visitors or the bear cams themselves, and that's the lynx. Now, there's actually four different cats that are all under the genus lynx. Um, there is the Eurasian lynx, the very rare Iberian or Spanish lynx, uh, the Canadian lynx, and the bobcat. Now, today we'll be talking about the Canadian lynx, but since we are in Alaska and not Canada, I'll mostly just be referring to that cat as a lynx. And can you tell us the difference between a lynx and a bobcat? Sure, there's actually quite a few different uh, differences between them, although it can be hard to tell without a side-by-side -side photo, which we actually have for you right now. Um, so a lynx has a more rounded back, uh, they have their rear legs are longer than their front legs, which gave them an angled appearance, and they have more uh, a longer tail and longer ear tufts. Though if you're close enough to see those, you're probably too close to that cat. Um, you can also tell by their tracks. A lynx has more spread out toes and much more fur on their toes, and the reason for that is that is their snowshoe. It allows them to skim across the top of the snow after their prey in the winter. Let's see. Um, so the other differences between them is their coat. So a lynx has a more muted brown coat and less distinct spots than a bobcat does. However, that's still giving you a medium-sized brown cat with ear tufts and a bobtail that you're telling apart from a different medium-sized brown cat with ear tufts and a short tail. Um, luckily for us here in Alaska, we only have the lynx and not the bobcat. As you saw from that earlier picture of their ranges, they do not overlap that much. So if you're seeing a large cat here in Katmai, it is probably going to be the lynx. Now, are lynxes good climbers? Do they like to swim? So like, your average house cat, they will climb just about anything. They're actually really good climbers. But different from your house cat, they uh, do actually swim pretty well and they are not averse to water. So you might actually see a cat in the water swimming around. Um, and they are very adept at chasing prey, either up, tra uh, up trees or into the water. Uh, now mating season for the lynx is in early spring, usually April, May, and after a gestation period of two to three months, they'll have between one and six kittens. Um, now the kittens are born blind and pretty much naked and pretty helpless, but they will start hunting after only seven to nine months and they'll leave their mom about 10 months old, uh, even though they do not reach their full adult size until uh, about two years of age. A lynx is a specialist hunter, and although they'll eat just about anything they can catch, including grouse uh, and mice and squirrels and fish, um, although you probably won't see them up on the lip like the bears, uh, most of their diet is actually the snowshoe hare. So now let's talk about the seven, second character of today's chat, which is the snowshoe hare. Um, they have that name because proportional to their size, their feet are huge. Uh, and that is to allow them to, again, skim over the top of the snow in winter. Um, this helps them, with, along with their speed and agility, to uh, get away from prey. 
Now, they are usually about three to four pounds as an adult, which is fairly small for most hares. Uh, and they change color with the season, which is handy because camouflage is one of the ways that they evade predation. Um, it's one of their best defenses. And because they change color with the season, they are also known as the varying hare because they vary in color. Now, they look a lot like rabbits, but there are some crucial dis differences. I don't know if you can still hear me over the plane. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> um, so for one thing, a hare's ears and legs are longer than a rabbit's. They have leverets instead of kits for their babies. And while rabbit kits are born blind, hairless, and helpless, hare leverets are born fully furred and ready to run from the moment they are out. Uh, hares are more solitary. They don't live in colonies like rabbits do and they live above ground. They do not dig burrows or warrens. And in fact, their leverets, their babies, are born in nests above ground, and they don't have that protection of being below ground where they're out of reach of predators, which is why they have to be able to run um, pretty much from the moment they're born. Now, both hares and leverets, there's a little picture of a baby leveret, fully furred, eyes open, ready to go, and terribly adorable. Um, they, uh, <laughs> Just like uh, rabbit kits, they are uh, only spending about 15 minutes a day with their mom, and that is just to nurse. And then the rest of the time, mom will actually leave them. And that helps them avoid detection while they're above ground. Um, now, some years, they are a very familiar sight here in Katmai. Um, and other years a little bit less so. This year we've been lucky that they have had hares running up and down the road and most of our visitors coming in have seen at least one. Um, now a fascinating fact about mother snowshoe hares is that they have not one uterus but two and so they can actually get pregnant with their second litter before they're finished with their first. Um, so before they've even given birth that first time. <laughs> That's absolutely crazy to even think about. Um, <laughs> Seems like a lot of work for mom. It does, it does. Um, but you did mention that the sight of these hares may be more familiar in some years as opposed to others. Can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, snowshoe hares go through what we call boom and bust cycles. And what we mean by that is in boom years, we have a big population expansion uh, where we'll have lots of hares running around and a lot of things coming after them too. And then we'll have bust years where the population declines. And with snowshoe hares, it's pretty drastic. Uh, for instance, in a boom year, you can have up to 6,000 hares in one square mile. And in bust years, in that same square mile, you might have as few as 31. Um, this picture you're looking at is actually from this year. This is a hare that was spotted out by ranger housing eating spruce tips. Um, so it's this boom and bust cycle that has such a big impact on the lynxes. Uh, it's about a 10 year cycle going from the largest numbers to the fewest and it happens repeatedly. It is a predictable cycle. Um, but lynxes, as I said earlier, will eat just about anything they can catch. But in those boom years when the hares are plentiful and uh, easy to catch, they make up about 80 to 90 percent of a lynx's diet. Um, and when the hares decline, the lynxes will have fewer kittens uh, and they will move away um, and their population will decline as well although on a bit of a lag so about two years behind where the hare is in their cycle the lynxes will be on the same sort of cycle so then as the hare population declines and the lynx population starts to follow with that decline does that mean that the lynxes are then starving some of them will although they are not uh, stuck only eating snowshoe hare, so they will eat whatever else is available, um, although some of them will starve. But a good majority of them will actually just leave. Uh, they will go to areas where the, the hares are in a different part of their cycle and are so more plentiful. Uh, they will also have fewer kits or, may, or kittens or maybe not at all. And it will also change the age at which a lynx will start to have uh, her young. In a boom year where there's plenty of hares around to feed her litter, she will start having kittens as young as a year old and she'll have more of them. Whereas in a bust cycle when they are less plentiful, she will either wait till two years old or maybe not at all uh, and she'll have 
far fewer of them and fewer of them will survive. So can you talk a little bit more about um, the lynx range? You know, have we, are there any collared lynxes? How do we know how far they go? So uh, there are different places that have done studies on lynxes and have collared them. And it's been pretty remarkable to see how far away they'll go. Most lynxes, their range varies from about uh, five square miles to as large as 100 square miles. However, uh, it, with tracking collared lynxes, they found that when the hares are not as uh, easy to catch or not as plentiful, they'll move more than 400 miles away. Uh, and they've been spotted well outside of the, the studies range uh, impacting other areas. So they'll, they'll move quite a distance. Um, and since I said earlier, they like to swim, they have no problem getting across rivers or other barriers that you might think would stop them. So with that too, are hares and lynxes considered endangered in any areas? So in the lower 48, lynxes are considered threatened, not endangered. Uh, however, um, there are two states that still allow trapping for fur of lynxes, and that is Montana and Alaska. Uh, they're actually, despite how uncommon it is to see them here, they are still fairly plentiful here, which is lucky for us. Um, and snowshoe hares are pretty abundant, especially in those boom years. So they are not considered threatened or endangered. Well, in that case, a lot of our visitors can hope to see a lynx while they're here, um, but where would they be most likely to spot a lynx here at Katmai? Uh, well, they're frequently seen on the road here. In fact, if you go on the Valley of 10,000 Smokes tour while you're here, we've had a lot of visitors report seeing them. That picture that showed earlier of the lynx that I took last week was actually up by the falls. Now they aren't usually seen at the falls, first of all, because that's a heavily occupied area by some of our larger predators, the bears. Yep. Um, but they are still around and they do eat fish or whatever else they can catch. So uh, I found one scoping out the sites there and uh, they are very elusive. Uh, part of that is, although they're vocal animals, Sorry, we've got a bear off to our side creeping up on us. It caught my attention for a minute. Um, although they are quite vocal animals, lynxes will purr, hiss, meow, just like your cat. They'll move silent through, silently through the woods and they'll know you're coming before you ever see them. So a, several lynxes might have seen our visitors, but our visitors didn't spot them. Well, Katmai also does a lot of wildlife research. You recently came back from a bear monitoring trip out in the preserve. Um, we also have groups doing coastal wolf research. Um, so are there any studies going on right now by the park or in the park um, on the lynxes or the snowshoe bears? So as you mentioned, we do monitor the bears. Uh, so there's a lot of research on that and the wolf study, including the genetic study on bears that we talked about recently. And I think there's a, a talk coming up about the wolf studies. Um, but there are not currently any studies in the park on the lynx. However, we do have, um, and we have had for many years now, an ongoing study on the number of spruce grouse and hares along the Valley Road. And so that is a collective effort by all the rangers as they go on to, uh, on that road to count spruce grouse and hares. So to expand a little bit more on that survey, what exactly is the spruce grouse and the hair count? How do we use it? Why is it important that we do that here? Yeah, so it gives us a defined area uh, to count on. And by figuring out how frequently we are seeing spruce grouse and hares on that valley road, we can kind of figure out how many we have in this area of the park. If you're seeing a ton of hair on the, hares on the road, there's probably a ton of hares in Brooks Camp. If you're seeing a ton of spruce grouse on the road, you're probably gonna see a ton of spruce grouse in camp. And it just gives us a better idea over a defined area. Um, and I have the data from 2012 up till around now, um, cause it is still currently ongoing. Uh, and starting in about 2014, what the rangers did sort of as what Ranger Barber would call competitive jibber jabber, or as we call it, um, just bragging rights. In addition to marking down the spruce grouse and the hares that have been seen, rangers will also mark down anything else they've seen that's particularly interesting. So we've had reports of 
tundra swans or moose or bears or lynxes. And so starting from 2014 and on, even though technically we're not counting the lynxes on the road, we do have an idea of how frequently they're seen there. And we are able to compare, you know, we've seen this many hares because we've been counting those, but we also be, seem to be seeing this many lynxes in that same area. Uh, and that gives us a good idea of who and what's around. Yeah, so talking about traveling along the valley road, we do have those bus tours that travel along the road. And often we enlist the help of our visitors to find spruce grouse and hares. But can you explain more how, how they do help? Because it is hard to identify something when you've never seen it or you don't know what it looks like. Yeah, um, and actually when I lead those tours, I really try to get the people on the bus to help me out um, for a number of reasons. One is a long bus ride and I have a short attention span. So sometimes I don't happen to see what just came up in front of the road in front of us because I'm talking to someone else about something or I am discussing things with the driver or I'm doing those radio call outs that we have to do. So having more eyes on the road means I'm more likely to get an accurate count of what we're seeing. But you're right, it is hard to count things that you don't know what they are. Uh, so I will admit that I bring it down a level. <laughs> I tell people to look for something that looks like a bunny rabbit, because uh, hares do look very similar to those bunnies. And I tell them to look for a very pretty but very misplaced chicken, because a spruce grouse kind of looks like a decorative lost chicken. <laughs> Absolutely, I can attest to that. Um, so as we start to wrap this up, are there any fun facts about lynx or hares or anything else that you do want to share with us today? Yeah, actually I do. Um, a couple things that you may not know. A, again, sorry about the plane noise, we're doing our best. Um, a snowshoe hare can run up to 27 miles an hour and leap up to 10 feet, which is pretty impressive considering, like I said, that's only about a two to three pound critter yeah. that we're talking about. <laughs> so that's a good distance for them to go. Now, unfortunately for them, a lynx can run at 50 miles an hour and can leap 25 feet. Um, now, that's not an automatic loss for the hare. They are still pretty easy to catch, first of all, because they blend in really well, and second of all, they such amazing agility. So in a study done somewhere else, unfortunately not in Katmai because we haven't done a study here yet, um, they found that lynxes were successful in their hunts about 28% of the time. So a good number of the hares do escape. Um, and it, it, the success of the hunt mostly depends on how close to the hare the lynx can get before the hare re realizes that it's there. Uh, and one more fact that I want to leave you with, because this one kind of threw me for a loop. Uh, snowshoe hares are not strict vegetarians. They have been known to eat carrion when times are rough. Uh, so it's a distressing thing to think about, but also kind of amazing that they've adapted to our very harsh winters by eating whatever is available. Absolutely. I mean, as we've been talking about the hares, the lynx, the bears, pretty much everything here at Katmai is very resilient and they find ways to adapt and survive, which is really fascinating. And it's a great thing to be able to experience and watch, whether here at the park or on the bear cans. Um, we do have a little bit of time for questions. So if we get those up on the screen, then we can see what our audience is interested in learning more about. Um, so the first question, do the lynx come to the river to eat dying salmon in the fall? Are they afraid of the bears? So they do eat salmon. Um, however, they haven't really been spotted on the cans as far as I know. Uh, some of you who are full-time watchers of the bear cams might have a better answer th to that than I do. However, um, they tend to stick more to the woods. Most of their diet is that snowshoe hare and um, the salmon are kind of a, a secondary food source. They're not gonna go for those if there are other things available. And although I wouldn't say that they're afraid of the bears, um, as I said, lynx can run at 50 miles an hour. A bear can run at 35, which is still better than you, but not quite as, as good as a lynx. Uh, the lynx don't really have that much to fear from the bears. They're not gonna test that. Um, and so they're gonna give the bears their space and they're not really competing for the same things. What predators do lynx need to avoid here in Katmai? Well, pretty much just people. Uh, their biggest predator 
is fur trappers, which of course they can't do in the park itself because that would be illegal. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, fur trapping is generally what takes them down uh, as far as predation. However, climate change and habitat loss are the two greatest threats to lynx, much more than the trappers are. Why do we not see the lynx on the camps? And what is their typical hunting grounds? So we mostly don't see the lynx on the cameras because they're facing the wrong way. Um, although lynx can swim and do if they need to, that's usually if they're chasing something. Um, they're not usually going in to fish. Now, if we pointed the cameras the other direction towards the woods or towards the road where they can have an all out chase of a hare, you might see a few more. Um, but just pointing at the falls and the river, unless they're passing by on the riverbank, you're probably not going to see them. And with all the bears that are around, that's an area that they're less likely to be successful with their hunts, so they're more likely to avoid those areas. Um, and as far as their typical hunting grounds, they go for forests and tundra and wherever the hares are. All right, we have time for a few more questions. Um, do lynx sleep a lot like house cats? <laughs> that is a fabulous question, and I wish I knew the answer to that. Um, however, without a study being done on it, I don't know. Are Arctic hares a different breed? Arctic hares are a different breed than snowshoe hares. Um, and I had a whole list of differences, but I don't have them with me because I wasn't going to talk about Arctic hares today because they are not here in Katmai. Uh, their range is much farther north than the snowshoe hares. All right, so what is the relationship like between bears and lynxes in Katmai? Well, there isn't that much of one, um, mostly because they're going for different things. Uh, and both of those animals are animals that don't really want to have confrontations where they risk getting injured. So they mostly just avoid each other. There's, there's not a lot of relationship between them. Awesome. Well, thank you, Kara, for joining us today to teach us more about snowshoe hares and lynx, two different predators and prey. Um, here in Katmai that we don't get to talk a lot about. Um, thank you to our viewers for tuning in and for your questions. And of course, thank you to our friends over at Explore. We do have quite a few programs coming up in the next couple weeks. Fat Bear Week is just around the corner. Um, so stay tuned into the bear cans. And as our friends at Explore like to say, never stop learning. <laughs>